We will see that in today's talk how the mass balance will be discussed the next part of it. So it's quite possible that the geometry of glaciers can influence the amount of incoming solar radiation. Geometry, you mean if it is located between very steep slopes and glaciers is highly elongated and it is a trap between two huge mountain regions, both sides they have mountain regions, then incoming solar radiation will be in space because of the presence of mountain So up to that extent, a uh, shape will influence the paint because it is not per se the shape which determines the paint, but due to shape, the incoming solar radiation is influenced. If another parameter is the slope. Slope can also determine incoming solar radiation. And so orientation. So if you put the shape under broader umbrella of all these categories, then yes, <laughs> they. But remember one thing: science is incoming solar radiation, amount of incoming solar radiation on glacier surface and glacier characteristics. It means whether they are debris cover, what is its albedo, what is these are the parameters which influence the main. And incoming radiation can be influenced by ship. I mean, that is the idea. What is your next question? Uh, my next question is why small glaciers in Himalaya region are showing faster retreat than the bigger ones? What is the actual cause for that? So there are a couple of fundamental reasons for that. Right. One of the key reasons is, is the response time of the glacier. Okay. So what it means is the larger is the glacier, it has a longer depth, bigger depth. And if you have a bigger depth, then it has a larger response time. That is one part of story. And because of that, change in mass balance, it takes longer time to respond to glacier. That is one part of story. Another part of story is most of the small glaciers are located in low altitude region. And if low altitude region means that they melt faster because temperatures are higher than low altitude compared to that. So these are the two fundamental reasons. That is why small glaciers are retreating faster than bigger ones. Next question. My third is the what is the actual cause of uh, Karakoram anomaly? I want to understand is it related to two dominant wind patterns like westerlies or Indian southwest monsoon or it is or is it related to heavy snowfall which is happening there in Karakoram? So uh, if we are going to discuss mass balance today, so you will get a better handling on this issue. But since you have raised the issue of Tarakur, yes. see, uh, we know that we the significant amount of precipitation in Karakur, this is by western district of this, because of the western. Yes. And yes. and the Karakur mountain is the first mountain, the major mountain range when when that is. Uh, uh, when the western no, no, uh, class uh, class uh, class uh, uh, I think uh, maybe we can mute. Huh? So uh, because of that, there is heavy rainfall. If you uh, sorry, snowfall in Karakor, no doubt about that. But that does not mean that other glaciers, whether they are located in Leh or. They also receive a little bit less rainfall, but other mountain ranges also receive a significant rainfall. 
So the mass balance, because they are not retreating, because they are at a little bit stable mass balance condition. So mass balance is also function of the melt also. So one thing is there that this Karakoram, the mean altitude of Karakoram glaciers is much higher than the glaciers located in uh, in, a, in a Great Himalayan mountain range or Pir Panjal mountain range. As compared to that, these are much higher altitude. And top of that, Karakoram also receives higher snowfall. And the combination of these two, as of now, glaciers are so in stable condition. But remember, whenever it comes to the mass balance, Eastern East and West Karakoram are these two things, which is uh, some. So this, uh, some are positive, some are showing negative also, or some are, majority of them are stable. So it is a combination of two things. One is glaciers are located in very high altitude compared to other part of Himalaya, and they also receive compared to other part of Western Himalaya, they receive slightly higher in precipitation. So both the things make it, you know, you know, as of now it is stable condition. How long it will last needs to be looked at. Yeah. Okay. Uh, next, what was your next question? Hello, yeah. sir. No? Yeah, yeah. I'm just. Question. Hello, sir. I'm from JIT. Huh. Sir, okay. I regarding the dead eye zone. You said that in Parpati glacier there is dead eye zone. Whether it's hmm. moving, is it moves, sir? No, no. The basic definition of dead eye zone, dead eye, it is, it is not moving. If it is a moving, then it is a glacier. So it is called dead eye zone essentially because it is not moving. So it is a detached from main glacier body. Then how uh, the glacier moves, sir? How the? Glacier moves in Parvati glacier. No, no. How glaciers move uh, means you have seen a couple of lectures. Was you attending other lectures or you were not attending? Yes, sir. I am attending lectures. I am asking about the Parvati glacier, sir. Dead eye no, zone no. in Parvati sure. glacier. Dead eye zone is a much below the glacial terminus, right? Oh, uh, yes, sir. It okay. Is sir. Not, it is uh, is a below the glacial terminus. Dead eye zone, and there is a snout, and there is a glacier upstream of dead eye zone. Okay, sir. Okay, sir. Thank you so much, sir. So, uh, Arya, is there any other question? Uh, no, sir. Uh, okay, no, if there, we if can stop. There, if there's no question, then uh, we have uh, now, seems like number of attendees are reducing, but interesting lectures are going to come now. I hope they will, they will join. So, what I will talk today is, is glacial mass balance. Some of the questions you have reached, you are asked, you will get some elaborate answer on that uh, in now. So, what we will see that the question is what is the glacial mass balance? So, the mass balance is nothing but a difference between snow accumulation, that means in winter time, in summer time, how much snow is accumulated on the glacier. And, uh, and then how much snow and ice because is a melted, is ablated. So difference between these two is known as mass balance. There are also some other ways. It is not only snowfall which makes glacier to accumulate. Uh, it is also due to avalanche because the surrounding region can can create avalanche and deposit significant amount of snow on the glacier. And in addition to that, there will be either winter precipitation or summer precipitation. So precipitation can be in winter as well as in summer. 
Uh, so we have to account for that. So the whenever it comes to melting, uh, so the mass is lost essentially because of melting of snow and ice in summer. Then there is also some sort of iceberg, you know, that means there is a carving takes place if glacier terminus is extended into the sea or in extended into the huge lake, then it is possi quite possible that there will be iceberg and they will, by carving, they will lose it. Or in very high altitude region, in, uh, you know, places like, you know, Mount Everest and other places, and under dry condition, there could be a sublimation that means directly it can lose, ice can lose into the vapor phase. If glaciers terminate in water, uh, so we know that iceberg block of ice will break and it can also lose its mass. So, and very cold and dry environment, it can be lost by sublimation. So, mass balance is basically influenced by temperature and snowfall. No? And the change in mass balance is an important indicator of climate change. It's quite possible that, as we have discussed today, that large glaciers may not respond quickly to the change in uh, mass. And because of that, many times, uh, because mass balance is a difficult parameter to estimate by using field methods, so people thought glaciers are stable. So it is quite possible that glaciers can continue to lose mass for some period of time, and that may not be reflected in its retreat, so it can, in past, tend lead to the certain erroneous conclusions also. That in addition to that, we also have to remember that the absolute values can be influenced by local geomorphology and terrain. Therefore, uh, it is not necessary that the climate change, uh, you can link absolute value with the climate change, um, but uh, relative change from year to year can easily be linked with uh, if you have a long data, then it can be linked with the climate change. So we have to. So there's a relationship between the climate and mass loss. That means you have a regional climate, uh, like what we have in entire Himalayan terrain. Then there's a local climate, uh, which is influencing. Uh, uh, influencing the glacial shape. So it is local climate which is influencing surface mass energy exchange, but local climate is also influenced because of the glacier. And if it is a huge region such as Greenland or Antarctica or places like Karakur, they can also influence the regional climate. So glacial mass can be caused because of um, carving or because of the specific balance, because of the energy exchanges. And then there will be glacier-wide mass or grain. As glacier-wide mass and mass loss or gain happens, it also influences the glacier area. Uh, so we have to remember that because change in mass means glacier will try to adjust to this mass loss, and it can in turn influence the regional climate and local climate. So this is the feedback loop and mechanism by which the climate influences the glacial mass loss, the mass loss influences glacier advance and retreat, and glacier and advance and retreat influence again the regional climate. So this is a feedback mechanism. So what is the systematically, schematically, if you want to see that, how specific mass loss is a, is a term which is generally used by glaciologists. Specific means over a unit area, how much is a mass loss. So essentially, you will have a two parameters. Uh, one parameter is about 
ablation, total ablation and one parameter is about accumulation. So what really happens is um, during the winter time, you can see here, during the winter time, there is the accumulation of snow will take place and uh, you can see certain amount of snow is accumulated winter and as summer progresses, this will start melting. Mm. And when it comes to the ablation, there is a very little melting in winter time and at summer comes it, it, it is it is again melted and the difference between these two is called net annual net balance. That means total accumulation in winter minus total ablation in summer. Difference is annual or net balance. That is the idea of glacier mass loss. There are very different methods by which to estimate glacial mass loss. And the historically, people have used the glaciological method to estimate the mass loss. But within the glaciological methods, there are different ways you can estimate mass. The whole idea in glaciological method is to see within a year how much is total snowfall and how much is the total ablation. That is the idea. So there are one way of looking is the stratigraphic method. Uh, so stratigraphic method is also considered as natural mass balance method. Uh, and in this method you estimate at the interval of year. That means uh, so how do you do that at the interval of year? It means you, uh, you go into the field, you estimate, you do the snow pits and identify the last year's position of snow surface. And then you estimate how much is accumulated about that and you put the stakes in ablation area and measure that how much during that period how much is a, a melting of um, ice has taken place and difference between that you will get you this the uh, mass loss which is called stratigraphy in india what we use is a fixed state mass we don't use the stratigraphic we use the fixed state essentially because it is not easy to frequently visit the glaciers because of extreme weather condition and September 30 is the time when it's quite possible that you can have a major snow storm and then you can stuck onto the glaciers because of uh, geological survey of India has started to use the fixed date fixed day. So it is between 1st October to September 30th. That is the date. So most of the mass balance, which is done by field method, is reported by using fixed date. So remember, it is from 1st October to 30th September. That is the year it is created. So this method doesn't require any attention to stratigraphy. Uh, so it is on fixed date you go uh, on the on the 30th September you go and uh, whatever is last year's 30th September. You take the position of sticks and then you get the uh, how much is melted. You go into the field, you, you find out how much is. Uh, take the uh, uh, you take the pit and found out how much is snow there and then you take the mass. Uh, in addition to that, there is also some issue that in many regions of Himalaya, accumulation and ablation are not distinct. Peak period of accumulation and ablation may be same. Uh, and in dry season, the accumulation and ablation may be less. So because of this, this method, which is fixed date method, has a limitation when it comes to the Eastern Himalaya that you cannot use uh, because accumulation and ablation is. Therefore, and but 
since accumulation and ablation is a continuous process, then what you are going to get can only give you net. That means that how much is remains at the end of year only you will get. So it is only net. You don't get a gross. What means is that there is some accumulation of snow in between the year and makes it. We don't know about that. What we know is what remains at the end of the year. So that is what it is called a net pass loss, not, not a gross amount. So we need to be flexible. Essentially, as I said, there are two issues in this. One issue is about, about the maritime climate in Eastern Himalayas. And therefore, you may not have distinct accumulation and ablation season, what you get in Western Himalayas. So you need to combine that both to get the realistic result. That means that when you take, take the uh, pit into the snow, pack, then you should be able to identify last year's snow accumulation, last year's snow position. That means you can get above that uh, how much is accumulated this year. So some kind of technique where you can use both things uh, is required and uh, that is how uh, you can get the better result, I think. Uh, so let us understand how these glaciological methods are applied. So there are how do you do in glaciological method? This is a picture, which is Wagner et al. and, and Farah Khazoum has, has done this work. So you can see essentially what you can do is, this is a glacier and Chota Shigini glacier, and you put sticks at different, whatever black spot you see, they are nothing but the sticks. So you put the sticks at different locations in a different altitude zone. So it should be well distributed. And you go into high altitude area and take a pit. You can see here, there are some pits here. There are pit here, there are pit here. Uh, so there are pit here. So you take the pit. So what you essentially you do is, you measure how much is ice melted here. You take a pit and, and say how much is snow remains there. And then you try to get the mass loss. So one of the difficulties uh, in this methodology is, is related to the stakes because you can have a lot of stakes in lower reaches in this region where there are huge amount of debris cover and because of that stake doesn't stick, they may fall. And how much is the representative of that region it needs to be, there's not much clarity. When it comes to the uh, pits, there are very few and we say that this, this is the, it is representative of large area. So we have a spot observation and then we try to make that spot observation to a large geographical area. How accurate it is, how reliable it is, it is not very uh, clearly understood. That is essentially because we know that in undulating terrain uh, and in the mountains, the accumulation will change, snow accumulation will be significantly influenced because of the topography. So that is also an issue in addition to that, the accuracy of map, that is also a very critical issue that uh, many times it is very difficult to find out where that glacier ends and where that new glacier starts. Or it is quite possible that uh, if you have this glacier and adjacent to that, there will be a lot of seasonal snow and it can remain there for some time and then you can call this glacier is entire this area is a glacier but reality glaciers will be like this so you have inflating the area because of presence of seasonal snow 
So all of these things add error into the into the your measurements, making it very difficult. Uh, so it adds significant amount of error into your results. Then there is also calming, but if you use the classical glaciological method, the calming will only can come only if it, you every year keep on modifying your map. If you are not able to modify your map every year, it it will be difficult for you to assess how much is lost due to carving and up to that extent error can come into the results. So by any standard, if you really look into the glaciological method is very, uh, very uh, time consuming and demanding method physically to go there and do the glacier. So when I was quite young and we were doing mass balance for glaciological method, it was indeed a, a full fledged expedition used to go and we used to say, uh, stay for very long period. And then uh, if there's a fall in, uh, in stakes, we will refix the stakes. So we used to do continuously, but in this, it is not, it is done only once or twice. Uh, it is not necessarily people stay there for months together. And that may or may not be needed. Uh, but it is a major enterprise by any standard. And it costs not only tremendous human effort, but also it is resources can but a lot of resources are needed. And because of that, there are few glaciers for which mass balance by glaciological methods is available. That is a, one of the lacuna of this method is uh, sometime two, three, I don't know as of now how many glaciers are being used for mass balance, maybe a couple, uh, one or two. It was time when, when it was peak, there are five, six glaciers. So remember, Himalaya has a huge number of glaciers. And Indian Himalaya has a large number of glaciers, but not more than five or six glaciers routinely mapped for mass balance. And uh, that is also not very continuous. That means it is not there for 20 years, 30 years, 40 years. It is only for few years. So it definitely puts a lot of difficulties in mass balance. So, so there are alternate methods were developed and that method is based upon equilibrium line altitude. We have seen what is the meaning of equilibrium line. And since in Himalaya, there is no superimposed ice. So I, our life is a little bit simpler because that we this equilibrium line shifts to the snow line. Okay, and since it shifts to the snow line, it is possible for the Earth to delineate the snow line in satellite image. So it is obviously a possibility for us to delineate snow line um, and then, then, then conceptually develop the idea what is the relationship between the snow line and equilibrium? That's the idea. We need to do that. So look into the equilibrium line. So there's a lot of confusion in many people's mind. What is the equilibrium line? Because basically there are two ways you can determine the equilibrium. And because of that, there is a confusion. There is no need to have a confusion, but it was, it is indeed there. So if you look into the, into the old literature of those people who are predominantly using glaciological method, for them, equilibrium line represents zero mass line representing zero mass star. So it is an imaginary line, right? Uh, so what is this line? So you take 
how you determine the if you have mass balance data, how you will determine the equilibrium part. What you will do is you have a stakes we have seen in previous slides. We have stakes in you. I can show you again that slide. You have stakes. This is the contours. And this is the 4000, I don't know, 300, 500. So you have different contours. So you have different stakes. In each altitude zone, these stakes. So at, at a different altitude, this space. So what you do now is, in each altitude zone, you plot the loss in mass. Correct. So by using stake, you have estimated mass. And you have plotted that mass, annual mass versus altitude. So this is from Chota Shigiri Glacier, the 4,200 to 5,600 meter. So you plot this graph and these figures from each altitude zone. And whenever it cuts, when you go very high altitude, there will be a positive mass balance. So wherever this cut, to the zero mass balance is the equilibrium line. So what it means is if we take one year, for some year the equilibrium line, which year is this would be check. So there's a two year data, uh, there's a lot of data is there, but you can see there are two, either you have Equilibrium line, it can keep varying. It is 5,200 meter, and here it is 4,000. So, depending upon year to year basis, this equilibrium line keep changing. So, what it means is that this is a altitude where mass balance is zero, and that is estimated by using field uh, by the field mass balance. What? But you can also conceptualize quite differently. What it means is snow line is a is a any given date. Suppose you have a snow line at the end of ablation season, mid season. You can also characterize as the equilibrium line. Essentially, because it also represents the zero mass loss. That means that amount along the snow line at the end of summer, the amount of precipitation and amount of ablation is also equal. If I if I am making my point very clear to you is because uh, that is why it's the snow line because along the snow line there is a whatever is the amount of precipitation is equal to the amount of ablation. So that is also representing zero loss, zero loss. But it is not the same. Both the figures are not the same. Mm. One is based upon actual mass balance and one, one is based upon the meteorological parameter. So what you can do, these are slightly different idea, then they are slightly different concept. But if we can reconcile the, both the concept and both the ideas, we will move on that. But in order to do that, first you need to know what is the snow line at the end of ablation season. So there are various methods people have tried and experimented on this. And one of the things you can do that is, you can monitor the snow line on the glacier, how snow line is retreating with time. And for that, AWIF data, which is the advanced WIF data of India, is known for extensively used, essentially because it is at the interval of five days, so that you can really get good temporal resolution and you will know how glaciers are how snow line is retreating. So you do it and you try to 
do the mass balance, so equilibrium line. That is how you can see, but there is a limitation. This method also has certain limitations. You can see here, depending upon year, what will happen is, you take for year 2001, this is in May, the region is completely covered by snow. In June it is. So you can see, even though in theory, you have a five-day repetitive coverage, you don't have that from 25th May to 28th June because of the cloud cover. So satellite can acquire, but visible and near infrared radiation has a limitation because of the cloud cover, and you don't get that. That is one part of story. Another part of story you can see here is what will happen is there will be a certain, say you take here, there is no, uh, September, 13th September, there is a snowfall. So uh, the snow line has come significantly downward and our data mass balance is the 30th September. So some amount of error comes into the data so that it is very, and you can see some year that snowfall happen, happens in July itself and making it very difficult for us to delineate. So that is the limitation. So right now we have two limitations. One limitation is field mass balance data. There's a, there's a some confusion. Whatever you are, the equilibrium line which represents the uh, zero mass balance, it means one thing in a field data and it and and satellite data which you estimate snow lines is slightly means different. One is meteorologically defined and another one is a glaciologically defined. So you have uh, these two and one is uh, uh, and another is a difficulty in finding snow line at the end of summer essentially because of the cloud cover and also because of the seasonal snowfall. So these are two difficulties. So how do we try and overcome these two difficulties is an important question. Uh, so let us bring this thought further uh, and then we can come back to this those idea. So what it you can do here is what is basically done is the first idea is uh, suppose you have by some or other means snow line at the end of summer suppose you are able to do it then you convert that into the accumulation area ratio and you can estimate the mass, mass loss. Now, this relationship which you develop, this accumulation area ratio, there are two ways you can estimate the accumulation area ratio. One way to estimate the accumulation area ratio is you take the ELA, which is calculated by using glaciological method. Or you take the ELA, which is estimated by, by remote sensing method. If you take it by remote sensing method, and then you correlate it with the mass balance to, which is estimated by glaciological method, then you are reducing your error. If you take the AAR by field method, then that relationship is not easy to transfer. So there is some more error into it. So we need to address this issue by this way. You can combine AAR, which is obtained by re remote sensing method, with mass balance, which is obtained by glaciological method. In that sense, you can reduce error, your error. Another key issue comes is what will is caused because of seasonal snowfall and because of the cloud cover, you don't know what is the end of end of season, what is the age. So this method is one of my doctoral students 
have developed this idea of using temperature index and then enter into the AR model. So what essentially you do is you get the winter precipitation and get the accumulation model. What it means is that uh, there are certain ideas were implemented into it. That means by using certain amount of uh, precipitation index, that means you have observation at one point, uh, which is slightly lower altitude, then by using this precipitation index, you can estimate how much is accumulation of snow in a different altitude. That is the idea you can use it. And by using the temperature, you get the temperature index model. That means in different altitude zones, there's a lapse rate. And you estimate how much melt is taken place in different altitude zones. And by using temperature index, you can estimate the melt in various altitude zones. So for a given altitude zone, you know how much is accumulation and how much is ablation. So then you can uh, run it till 30th September and and then estimate the equilibrium line altitude. So this equilibrium line altitude is an imaginary altitude ELA, and then use the accumulation area ratio. So key question in your mind must be coming when you have built an accumulation different altitude zone, why not use it and convert into the mass balance? Because that is what mass balance is about. But difficulty comes in this because, see, snow is a one, one parameter where you can predict how albedo is going to change. Essentially because uh, snow albedo is relatively high and uh, you can get it from uh, there are within the range it moves and therefore a uh, different part of year you can know but moment ice is exposed then there will be a debris cover there will be water or ponds on it so it gets very complicated it is possible to model it so i'm not saying it is not possible to model it but that modeling has to be glacier specific you cannot apply for large geographical area since we wanted to use it for area, we and our experiment suggests that a temperature index is not giving a really good result. Therefore, we did it with AR and then estimated mass balance. So in a sense, you are reducing the influence. You are only using temperature index to estimate the equilibrium line. And then from there, you are taking conventional AR approach and then estimated masses. Advantage of this method is, is, is that you can couple it with climate model because now in a climate model, you are going to get how temperature and precipitation are going to change in time uh, by 2030 and 2050. So what essentially you can do is that you will be able to estimate that how in future precipitation and temperature will change, plug into the model, and then you estimate the future changes in ELA as we have set in there, and from there you can change the future mass loss. So this is the advantage. In a glaciological method, you will have very tough, and even in geodetic method for which we will come there will be also a lot of difficulty in doing that. So this is the method which has been extensively used now, and this is the work you can say that from 1985 to 2009, how equilibrium line, uh, this is Siley's work, you can see that how equilibrium line is going to change, has changed, and it is slowly moving upward. 
uh, this is a theoretical equilibrium time. This is not equilibrium time. You can see that uh, in the field data. So you can estimate. So one of the advantage in this method is you can estimate annual mass loss. So this is one for 146 glaciers. We have estimated mass loss. So such estimates were anyway not available for um, for uh, large part of Himalaya. So this is the first time we have given estimate. Uh, you can also do a similar work by using geodetic method. Uh, but limitation, there are two fundamental limitations of geodetic method. That means one fundamental limitation of geodetic method is you will get it for a certain period of time. That means 10 years, 15 years a period only you will get. You may not get the annual mass loss. And second thing is it is not, you are not putting any meteorological or temperature and precipitation in it. Therefore, you cannot predict it for future. So if you want to know how it to predict for future, you have to use some sort of this um, arrangement where input is uh, in the meteorological parameter. So this has been extensively used now, and you can see here that mean annual loss, it is estimated for entire Himachal Pradesh and uh, so it is around 3,000 glaciers in Himachal Pradesh and the glacier area is 3,000. So mean annual mass loss is 1.65 gigaton per year and the total mass is 174 gigaton. So, uh, so this is how you can really estimate that how glaciers are going to lose mass on large, large region. Uh, so you can also um, look into geodetic mass balance, but the future change we will come later on. So uh, there are different methods and different ways of doing it. So we will come to that later on. Another thing is geodetic mass balance, uh, which you can use as a. So geodetic is an indirect method to determine glacial mass balance. You essentially measure the elevation change, glacial surface elevation change at two at two different points. Two different points means and, and, and time domain at two different period, and uh, and then you compare it, and the difference in thickness and will give you uh, and by if you know your density, you can convert it into mass loss. You can also get a very high quality GM if you use the differential GPS. So this method is, is a commonly used in this day and in here in Deveja also we quite extensively use this method to estimate. So essentially how you can do it? You can do it by using satellite images. You can do it by using aerial photograph as well. So when it comes to the satellite images, you have uh, many of you are familiar with estimation of digital elevation models for satellite images. What it means is you take two pictures of a land, which is the same land. You take two pictures, one one for one location and another for another location. So you take the picture from two different locations. Uh, and then, uh, since they are at two different locations, if there is an elevation, then there's a parallax. That means it will shift. So there's a parallax. By using parallax, you can determine its height. So you can look here into this picture. Is uh, uh, how do you do it? If you can look into uh, this picture, it is an inclined picture is taken, and you can see this is the top. And this is the bottom. So that is a vertical structure, but it looks like slanted. You, if you can, uh, you can design. Um, if you know uh, sensor characteristics and land characteristics, you can estimate what is the height of this this building. So that is how you can do 
this is how parallax is all about and that is how you determine the um, height of the object and you take it to but in order to do that you in, a, in this container you can go into the mountains and uh, this is probably uh, easiest way in my opinion to estimate glacier mass balance so you go into the mountains at predetermined places you est you get the uh, control point you get the uh, differential gps you run and you get the height of various points distributed in a satellite images you should have you should know the boundary of satellite images and within that you can go at different location gets the height you get the stereo pair then use this control points and estimate the uh, <clears throat> dm get dm at two different the points subtracted and you can see here that you can um, you can get the elevation change the beauty of this method is it is not necessary for you to do feel uh, the uh, gps data collection and the satellite data optimization could be quite different there's no need that you, you have to be just smart to ensure that you take this observation at stable places stable places and then you can do it so uh, just control point you can continue to use for very long period so that's the idea so this is extensively used uh, in these days but as i was saying to you earlier it has its own limitation to do it and limitation is you don't get the annual mass loss and you also don't get the the uh, future change is not able to do it by using ge uh, geometry but whether you use uh, 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 whether we have used this <clears throat> uh, ar method or geological method or you use geodetic math they are glacier specific methods that means we are going to get mass loss for a glacier but if you have a large glacier like say entire mountain range himalayan mountain range and even if not himalayan entire tarakoram and western himalaya you take there are thousands of glaciers are there this is going to be a major task for you to do it so one of the method another method over a which is the devler is a gravimetric method so it is using the grace method with the grace satellite you use and what fundamentally it is using is the change in the gravity is determined uh, as aircraft moves from one place to another place suppose aircraft is moving from non glacier area over a glacier area and then non glacier area so there is a change in speed and distance between two satellites there is a change in speed because of the gravity and there is a distance there is there is a change in that by using that you determine the you determine the change in gravity and convert it into mass law so that is the idea of gravimetric method and it is extensively used to get mass loss for large geographical area here you can see that loss of glacier in high mountain asia just look at the uncertainties you know so it is 4 plus minus 20 gigaton per year i don't know if this figure makes sense or not but there are the certain issues in this with the assumption in this fundamental assumption in this methodology is is that mass loss is caused because of the within the domain whatever domain you have selected large geographical domain all mass loss is caused because of the loss in glacier ice it's quite possible that there could be uh, some other mass wasting processes such as erosional and other can also remove certain mass from that domain 
But the argument which is given by this person is even if, if the domain is such a large that it is not uh, this mass resting, other mass resting processes has not pushed outside the domain, they remain within the domain. So that is why they say it is reasonably okay. So these are the methods we can do it. So there are a couple of slides uh, which we have not discussed. So suppose you take the example of, before I conclude, I would like to show you those slides which I skipped, that what will happen if ELA is above maximum glacial altitude. So that is the question which is uh, much more important in these days is that equilibrium line or snow line at the end of summer has gone such a high altitude that many glaciers maximum altitude is now below this. So what it really means is there are many such glaciers and as I was talking to earlier question, which was one of the students I asked is why low altitude, small glaciers are at altitude because they are at very low altitude and now ELA is our snow line at the end of summer is much above their maximum altitude making this glacier two things, it's loss of mass is very large. And in addition to that, there is no new ice is formed and making it very difficult for glacier to sustain. So these glaciers are definitely heading for terminal retreat. That means if this trend continues, you can expect that within, within a couple of decades, such glaciers will will vanish. So that is the idea uh, which was long proposed by me and the ELA. So, so all right. So uh, I will not now, there are a couple of more ideas uh, which are also there, but we will try to avoid to take those things now. Uh, and in next lecture, I will try to say how linked it is with the climate change and see how to estimate future change in glacier. So with this, I will stop and I will take some